Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 13, Episode 92. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Friday, Steelers Nation. Dave, still trying to find things to talk about Steelers related as the offseason has been pretty quiet, but at least we're not talking about the Pittsburgh Penguins. That is not a fun, not a fun time for the hockey team right now. Yeah, look, I uh, I watched that game. I've, I've watched the last couple, actually. This is about the only time of the season, time of a year where I can really watch like multiple Penguins games, you know, on on uh, consecutive uh, outings that they have or whatnot. I've actually been able to watch the last couple of them, and they've been uh, very, very disappointing to say the least. And man, that one uh, uh, last night, they were uh, they were shouting fire Hextall and. They were uh, booing, I mean, booing almost in every situation. Uh, even Crosby, I think, a time or two getting booed there. They were mm. cheer- cheering for a penalty shot for Connor McDavid uh, at, at the end of the game. And, uh, man, they, they just got their butt kicked last night. And uh, they're going to, they need Mike Tomlin in there right now. They, they need Mike Tomlin to take over to get uh, uh, for the latter part, part of this season to, to uh, so they can continue that uh, that consecutive year playoff streak uh, that that mm-hmm. they have going there, but uh, I feel sorry for Mike. I, I think Mike Sullivan's a hell of a hell of a hockey coach, to be quite honest with you. And if that guy was to get cut loose for any, it's the same situation kind of with with Mike Tomlin, in my my opinion. If you cut that Mike Sullivan loose, uh, he's going to be out of a job for like two seconds, kind 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 of thing. There, uh, I just don't think they've done a good job of. Uh, surrounding him with 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 you know the superstars with talent at this point, I think it's showing uh, right now, and I won't be surprised at all if this team that winds up not making uh, the playoffs. But man, you got the uh, the Steelers not making the playoffs these days. You got the uh, the Penguins look like they might not make the playoffs, and you got well. The pirates are the pirates, right? <laughs> hey, now the new season. Hope springs eternal this time of year. But yeah, the Penguins certainly need the the bye week reset. The Steelers had. Yeah, you uh, exactly. Uh, you're a bigger baseball fan than you are a hockey fan, aren't you? Yes. Uh, by how much? Pr- pr- pretty pretty large margin. Yeah, I would say so. I, I'm a little bandwagony with the Penguins. Obviously, I'm a Penguins fan just generally, but I really don't watch a lot of games until it's playoff time, which doesn't seem to be on the agenda this year. I'll more casually watch the Pirates and you know, Steelers, of course, are first. See, I'm I'm on the other end of the spectrum there. I, I grew up, uh, baseball was really kind of, you know, right there along as my first love and, you know, collecting baseball cards and uh, watching you know, every Pirates game that I could on, either they come on TBS or WGN uh, way back then when they play either the Braves or the, uh, or the, uh, or the Cubs. And then, uh, you know, I obviously at the same time was becoming a, you know, a Steeders fan at a very, very early age and all that manifested in becoming a Penguins fan, which you didn't have much to cheer for back, <laughs> back, back then in the seventies when, you know, uh, when it came to fall, heck, you couldn't even hardly uh, find a Penguins game. Uh, on TV, I don't think it was mm-hmm. until the '80s there until uh, the old, you know, the old USA Network uh, would start showing like Rangers and Islanders games, and then that that's what. But you know, over the years, ba- uh, long story short, uh, baseball's my third favorite sport at this point, and only slightly ahead of uh, basketball, which I really loathe at this point uh, after losing so much money on it. But uh, <laughs> I love me a good hockey game, man. I, I, I really, really do. I, and, and I can watch pretty much any hockey game if I have time, but I do like watching Peng- Penguins games if I do have a chance to do so. So uh, for me, obviously, it's football and then hockey and then baseball's a distant third behind that. And you were just at that minor league game when you were out to mm-hmm. San Diego, right? What were the teams? Is that part of like OHL? What is the, the uh, that's there? that's the AHL, believe it or not. That's mm, uh, okay. the San Diego goals and the uh, Ontario rain. Uh, the goals are uh, G U L L S. 
uh, or the minor, uh, minor league affiliate of the, I think the Anaheim uh, Ducks and then the uh, Rain are, are the AHL affiliate of the uh, Los Angeles Kings there. And I think the, uh, the, the, the fun thing about that was, man, that old building that they play, play in there, I think they call it Pachanga Arena now. Uh, but man, that, that thing was, that, that old barn was built originally back in 1966. And, uh, I mean, it's got a lot of history. You go, I made sure to go, go down the wormhole on the Wikipedia page and then follow links from that. You know how you can get, you know, a lot of great musical acts and concerts have happened in that building over the years. And obviously, uh, you know, they have a long sports tradition of, 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 of teams playing in that building as well, too. And, you know, there's a pretty good crowd there that night that we were there for that game. And on top of it was star Wars night, uh, <laughs> uh, the star Wars theme night on top of it. So I had, I had a really, really good time. I, I like some of those old barns whenever I get a chance to go to a game, especially in a city I've never been to before. And especially one that old that was built in 1966. Yeah, no, I'm glad you had a good time there. So let's jump into some Steelers talk now. The Steelers did do something since we last spoke. They re-signed their long snapper Christian Kuntz to a one-year deal. He was exclusive rights free agent, essentially meaning he was going to return to Pittsburgh. He basically did not have a choice. And so he'll return as Pittsburgh, as the Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, we presume starting snapper going into the summer. The Kuntz struggled quite a bit last year. Not that I care about PFF grades too much, but metrically. The numbers weren't kind to him. I think the tape kind of reflects that. But Christian Kuntz uh, re-signed to a one-year deal as the, kind of the Steelers' first actual player move of the offseason. Yeah, and the fact that uh, I noticed a few times in your Twitter feed of of you praising uh, Presley Harvin III for getting some mm-hmm. snaps down, uh, we, I, we should not have to see any of that stuff. You know, uh, uh, sometimes it's better if, if you go through a season and you barely remember the long snapper's name, unless sure. you're making a lot of tackles and all like that. I, and I, 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 you know, long story short, I'm with you. I think, uh, I think he could have been better. Uh, now, obviously I'm not, uh, you know, an expert on, 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 on long snapping and all like that, but, uh, there were quite a few times where I thought to myself, man, you know, he, he had to handle, uh, uh, you know, a bad snap there. So, uh, he will have competition, I think, this year in camp. You would agree? I would think so. They have not signed. Usually they sign a, a futures guy that's a long snapper. Last year it was uh, Rex Sunahara. He didn't make it to actually training camp. So we'll see. Um, as of right now, there's been nobody added. If, if they felt like they really wanted competition, I would have guessed they would have signed a futures guy after their season ended. Well, if you only have 58 guys under contract now and you got to get to 90. So that's 32 more players that you're going to be adding. Obviously, a uh, handful of those will be draft picks, a handful of those free agents. So uh, I'm willing to bet that uh, you know, they're, they're, they're going to wait and see what shakes out here, maybe with some of these cuts and probably not, at least by after the draft time, this team will have another long snapper uh, under contract to push him. At least they, I, I think they should. I think okay. they need to make sure they have another kicker uh, uh, in camp. I think they need to have another punter in camp uh, this year just to all make sure, you know, you have your bases covered there. Yeah, I wonder if they'll have a punter because they they cut their specialists, their backups pretty early last year, especially at punter. And I think that was them trying to give their vote of confidence to Presley Harvin saying, hey, you're our guy. Take the pressure off yourself just a little bit. Don't press. You know, we have faith in you. So I don't know if that'll be be their approach this year. Harvin improved. Uh, Specialists, you know, generally were were fine. Again, Kuntz was not terrible. There was no disastrous snap, but there were a couple that felt a bit off the mark. So we'll see. But that's the. The move there, Christian Kuntz, the local native, who, again, just so funny to think about him playing outside linebacker a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. picking up a sack in a preseason game. And now he's the Steelers long snapper for, for the past two seasons. But what does this leave Pittsburgh cap wise? Obviously not moving the needle significantly, but just give an update there. Yeah. And first and foremost, nah, well, it's a one year deal for Kuntz, 940,000. I would think either today or in the next couple of days, we're going to hear p- potentially about uh, Jameer uh, Jones is the team's other exclusive rights free agent. Uh, that will be a one year, $940,000 deal as well that I'd ex- expect him to sign. But based only on uh, what we have uh, that, you know, that we know for sure at this point, pulling up my. The trustee salary cap uh, page right now. 
this team, as I mentioned, has 58 players under contract as we sit here right now. Uh, essentially, when you factor in the proven performance escalator raises for both Alex Highsmith and Kevin Dotson, uh, you factor in... There was a slight adjustment, I think, that needed to be made on uh, William Jackson III and, and, and per game roster bonus uh, breakdown that I have corrected as well, too. But uh, and then the uh, offseason uh, workout bonus placeholder amount that will that will hit you know right here around the 15th as well, too. I have the Steelers currently projected to sit exactly eight hundred and thirty eight thousand one hundred and eighty one dollars over the cap right now so obviously they can't be over the cap here uh in less than three weeks from now uh you're gonna you're already starting to see moves around the league right with uh with uh with teams cutting uh players and 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 dumping salary cap space along those lines there so this team essentially is right at the number Right now, there's going to be moves to be made. We talked, uh, we just talked about how probably going to be another uh, exclusive rights free agent signed in Jameer Jones. That's going to eat up a tiny bit of uh, uh, salary cap space uh, based on uh, roster displacement with him. We talked the other day about, you know, these uh, restricted uh uh, tenders that this team is likely to give. I mean, we feel pretty good that the team's going to give at least two of those and possibly even three, right? Right. I mean, so you're looking at roughly needing another $5 million in salary cap space to accommodate uh, all of those after roster displacement as well, too. I mean, I, I've, I've basically have, have taken $6 million uh, of cap space that they don't have right now and assigned it to an exclusive rights free agent uh, in, in, in Jameer Jones and three additional uh, uh, restricted, you know, free agent tenders here that we think are, 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 are coming. So obviously this team's got some moves ahead of them. Uh, William Jackson, the third being the most notable we expect to happen here pretty soon. And then we'll get into seeing, What's going to happen with guys like Mitch Trubisky and Miles Jack and Akella Witherspoon and 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 those sort of things? Uh, we should have all of our answers to within the next uh, couple of weeks and a half. Why do you think the Steelers tend to wait on some of these obvious cap casualties? We know that William Jackson is going to be released. Why not do it now, it, just so he knows, the team knows? Is that just just a way they do business type thing where it's around combine time where those decisions kind of really cement or do you think it's just the way of doing things and the way they've always done things? I think it's just process, right? You know, right. I just think that's the way they do. You know, you, you hold on to a player until the last possible moment that you can because you never know what might happen. Uh, Lord knows things happen, right? I mean, sure. uh uh, things beyond everybody's control sometimes happen. So, uh, I think first and foremost, you know, especially if there's, you know, no guaranteed type situation or a dateline that you're, you know, that, 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 that you're dealing with here. Look, uh, uh, William Jackson, the third's got a, uh, <laughs> uh, a roster bonus coming up, I think on the fifth day of the new league year. So they, there, there's your line in the sand right there, let alone March 15th in and of itself being a day that you have to be cap compliant by. So mm -hmm. uh, I just think that they, uh, you know, it's just the way they do. I mean, look, even during the season with elevations and roster moves and uh, final cut down day, right. You know, they they roll all this out until the last possible minute. I, I just think that's a process with them. And I think it's just because, look, we have until this amount of time. We're going to use all that mm -hmm. time because you never know what might happen. Yeah, I think you're right. That's a, that's a fair answer there. So that is the Steelers' latest move. As you said, we'll see if Shamir Jones follows suit with Christian Kuntz here shortly. Probably will. Maybe early next week. We'll have to, to wait and see. Dave, I want to go back to... I know you and I discussed the Aaron Curry hire, you know, quite a bit during the week. I haven't discussed as much because it broke mid podcast on Wednesday about Jerry Olsavsky officially leaving. And he's, his name has now been removed officially from the Steelers uh, team site. So he's gone after a long career as a player and then as a coach since 2010, linebackers coach since 2015. So your thoughts there just on 
Osavsky's departure, what might have led to that. And again, this coaching staff still looking small. 16 overall, five on defense. Will anyone else get added? Yeah, I got to be honest. I really haven't given it much thought since the other day there. I mean, I find it a bit curious that, you know, uh, 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 bringing Curry in to, you know, sounds like more so coach the inside guys uh, than the outside guys. But, I mean, uh, at least he has defensive experience. He has played a little bit off the ball, I think, during his career. So it's not it's not like it's out. It's not like you're asking. Uh, it's like it's a, an offensive line coach that you're asking, right. you know, uh, or it's like not like Matt Patricia, right, being a uh, going from a defensive coordinator to a, to an offensive coordinator mm-hmm. uh, uh, type situation there. So, I mean, outside of just being a little surprised by the group that he's coaching, I mean, I don't, I don't really have a lot to add there overall. I mean, he, he is considered or was considered uh, kind of an up and coming, you know, uh, uh, coach in the league, I think, if you will, you know, obviously uh, part of the uh, Bill Walsh diversity uh, coaching program. I think he spent a little time with the Bengals and the Panthers there. So uh, it, 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 it is nice to see them kind of, get an up and comer, I guess, in that area there, as far as the, the Jerry Olsavsky, uh, stuff, I mean, who, 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 who knows what, what's happening there? You know, uh, look, the, uh, the Steelers inside linebackers haven't been great for several seasons. Now we know that, sure. uh, a, 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 as a position group, uh, Jerry Olsavsky, uh, obviously tragically, you know, or just recent last, last year lost his wife, uh, there, maybe he's had a change of heart and, mm-hmm. Uh, of what he wants to do with the rest of his life as well, too. Maybe he wants to live. I, it's just, it's very hard to speculate what may or may not have had. Maybe his heart's not in it. Maybe it's performance rated. Maybe it's a little bit of, of, of both related to him. I mean, he has been with the organization for quite a while. I guess we'll sit and wait and see if maybe he surfaces somewhere else on another organization, you know, right. uh, uh, someone with that experience, you would think that you now within at least a year's time uh, that he would get another job again. I mean, there was talk at one time about Jerry Olsowski maybe being in line as an up-and-coming defensive coordinator candidate, wasn't there? I believe so, yeah, and, and, and follow this into the whatever-it's-worth category, but the team never actually made a comment about mm-hmm. Olsowski no longer being with the team. Generally, when a coach leaves, they announce that in some form or fashion when – Frisman Jackson was hired last year to replace Ike Hilliard. It was Ike Hilliard not retained, Frisman Jackson hired. And in the same press release, to my knowledge, the team has not made mention at all about Osavsky leaving, but his name has been wiped off the Steelers' uh, front office page on their team website. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what to read all into all that, Alex. And once again, yeah, you know, I it, just sit here speculating of, of, of well, uh, uh, things that might have happened. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, we'll just have to, you know, like I said, over the course of this next calendar year, see if old Sha- old Osafsky, uh surfaces somewhere with the team in some sort of, you know, uh, position group role or, 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 or not. But, uh, yeah. you know, well, back, uh, but back to Curry real quick. And once again, sure. you know, it's good. It is good to see kind of an up and comer. Uh, be hired to the staff, some fresh blood, if you will, you know, uh, uh, at a position group that could really use it. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm excited for that hire. To, to the second part of the question, five defensive coaches right now, That would, that's going to be the smallest in football if that were to, to stay the same. Do, that, do they hire anybody else? And if so, what area could they potentially help? Is that going to be the senior defensive assistant catch-all kind of thing? Is it more help somewhere else? I mean, it's this team, they can't really have five defensive coaches in football in 2023, can they? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. I mean, we'll we'll see, right? I mean, here we are already uh, the 24th. You got the combine uh, right around the corner here next week. I mean, I, I would think by March 1st, we'll, we'll have the answer to that question, right? Yeah, I mean, last year, a couple of hires came in late. David Corley wasn't hired until... I think April, Isaac Williams, I think, was a mid-March hire. Those were assistant quarterback and offensive line coaches. Again, I'm still expecting this team to hire a replacement for Blaine Stewart, so I don't believe all the coaching hires are done yet. Um, Will they hire somebody defensively? They don't have to. I mean, they do have somebody for each position group because Carl Dunbar, Denzel Martin works with the edge guys, and so that's D-line edge, Curry with the off-ball linebackers, Brady Brown with the secondary. Could they 
Could they hire an assistant secondary coach to help Brady Brown out? Because that's a big group. They typically in recent years have had more pairs of players, but because Tomlin and Austin are defensive back minded coaches, that's their upbringing. Maybe they don't need an assistant truly there to help run that room. I, I'm just kind of thinking out loud about what they, what they could add. So we'll see, but if it is, and again, right now the coaching staff sits at 16, I assume one more will come in at the least to replace Stewart. So that's 17. They were at 19 last year. I don't know if they're going to be at 19 this year. Right. Uh, definitely something to, to, to pay attention to. And once again, you would think, and you know, once these pro days start getting underway, which are only a couple of days after, after the combine ends, right. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you want, you want your coaching staff in, intact at that point, I would think. Right. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, we'll see if the combine maybe, you know, spur something that is a time where the whole NFL gets together and that may be a time to do some informal interviews and get to know each other. So we shall see. But that is the latest on the Steelers coaching staff. The latest on the Steelers players is a bunch of guys down in Florida right now. And Kenny Pickett, Mitch Trubisky and almost all the receivers, if not all the receivers on this roster and Deontay Johnson, George Pickens, Steven Sims, Gunnar Olszewski. Calvin Austin down there. That's a great sign for him. Connor Hayward, tight end, down there as well. So as promised, as Pickett, I think Trubisky said throughout the year, they were going to bring the guys down to Florida. Trubisky has a home down there. And so that's where they're training right now. Yeah, I guess the next couple of days, maybe a few, p- p- potentially not a few names that are down there, we'll you know, get confirmation on. It looks like, I don't know for sure, but maybe Miles Boykin is – is around some water somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where in the world is Miles Boykin? That's yeah, the new show. Yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't know you realized what, uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Are you old enough to have watched that? Only old enough to know the reference. And that's okay. all I know about the show. So okay. don't ask me any more questions. Cause that's all I got for you. We did figure out last night. Did you have seen slap shot though? Right. I have on TV. I don't know if it's one okay. of those shows where you need to watch the actual movie. Oh yeah, you gotta watch. You gotta probably. have all the yeah. yeah you gotta have all I, the cussing and all like that. Yeah. yeah. And when I watch it on like TBS or something, probably doesn't get the full slap shot experience for right. the way that movie is run. Yeah. Did you enjoy it for even a TV version, or was it like meh? I liked it. Yeah. But I mean, I, I like generally sports movies, so it was a good movie. Okay. Yeah, you gotta watch that uncut. Uh, what about uh, Cool Hand Luke? Uh, another Paul Newman classic. Have you watched that yet? No, still have not. Oh I'm very man, sorry. You, that, that's a that's a very that's a great great movie. You gotta. When, when What's you it about? Something. Is that a sports movie? No, it's not a sports movie at all. It's so. uh, it's about old uh, old time kind of you know uh, chain gang gang. Uh, you just I, I don't want to give it give it away, but okay. you uh, uh, it's definitely better than that damn movie that you referred me to. That Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Or I can't believe you didn't like that. Movie. Oh man, my wife even the other day still. Uh, <laughs> Come on, Tiff. No, nah, she hounds me for uh, wasting her time with it. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, it's a wonder you got paid this week, Alex. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's right. Just, the paycheck was a little bit low, little bit lighter. Uh, no, no, no. I'm nah. kidding. Uh, but uh, she mentioned something the other day about uh, something jogged her memory on and all like that. <laughs> I, I keep trying to forget I had to waste, what was it, 92 minutes or something like that? God, I didn't know it was that bad. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to waste your time. Yeah. You know, I'm a movie critic. Yeah. Now, I realize there's a lot of big names in that. Some of the acting was really, really good. I just, I didn't get the whole preface of the movie, I guess. All right. You know? all uh, right. But Pittsburgh but you, train. I, I guarantee you, you, you will enjoy uh, Cool Hand Luke if you get a chance to watch it. Uh, Pittsburgh uh, and these guys are training. Yeah, uh, we'll see what happens throughout the rest of the, the week. It looks like they're eating fine down there as well, too. So uh, uh, we'll see if any other players we get confirmation on, guys like Miles Boykin. I would think Pat Fryermuth not down there. He had mentioned that he just wanted to kind of lay low to rest that knee a little bit right. there. So probably not surprising that he's not down there. Uh I, I haven't spotted Zach Gentry yet. That doesn't mean that he's not down there, but maybe he's not. He's obviously got, you know, free agency, uh, started free agency right around uh, the corner. Maybe he's just protecting himself that way as well, too. But uh, for the most part, though, like you said, it seems like they got a lot of guys down there. And this is something that Pickett and I think Trubisky both said uh, at the end of the season as well, too. They expected to get these guys together a couple times. So uh, it's definitely great to to uh to see them use their time this early in the offseason to do this kind of stuff 
Definitely. And kudos to Trubisky for showing that leadership. Obviously, his future a bit uncertain this past year didn't go the way that he wanted it to, but to still have those guys around and knowing that you know, there's still a chance he, he may not be a Steeler next season. And those rumors have kind of kicked back up some. I don't know how much you want to talk about that point again, but uh, just like that leadership you know, quality from, from Trubisky and, of course, from Kenny Pickett as well, and for Calvin Austin to be down there. Have we seen Austin actually run routes? I just want to try to get a gauge of where he's at, you know, foot health of his foot wise. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's enough out there to disseminate how how hard he's going or anything. Maybe okay. some some more will, will will surface today. Look, the idea that he's down there doing anything is fantastic. Yes, mental reps, so much to catch up on. So just yeah, the presence itself is is obviously the most important thing. But if we see him running some routes, even a better sign, you know, showing that. This guy's healthy and, and basically back to form. You know, last that we kind of really had the update on him was what about two and a half, three weeks ago, and that was at the uh, uh, at, at, at at the Steelers practice facility, and it wasn't even a full out sprint; it's more of a jog, you know. Uh, but I mean, obviously, that was a great sign uh, with him. So uh, I would imagine that he's probably not full full speed yet, but right. But once again, the fact that he's down there and he's able to participate in this kind of stuff and it's only February, I mean, that 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 that's fantastic news. Yeah. So obviously this is stuff that almost every NFL team does. Their guys get together to train, but still important, especially for how young this offense is and, and was last year. The more they can work together, the more that they can grow, uh, the more you would expect that jump in year two to happen. So that's the the exciting part there. I agree. All right, Dave, what else do we have? We have some, uh, as you mentioned, NFL calendar moving right along. Combine coming up, start of the new league year uh, in, in just a couple of weeks on March 15th. And so you're seeing some of the cap casualties around the NFL. Two names that potentially could interest Pittsburgh at positions of need. Taylor Lewan. I know we've talked about it so much over the last four to six weeks. Uh, former offensive tackle of the Tennessee Titans knew that release was coming. He even admitted it. But uh, Taylor Lewan officially released by the Titans uh, earlier this week with a failed physical designation. Lewan even saying on his podcast, his knee still has to get healthy. So he's not at 100 percent. But he did reiterate his uh, interest in playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then Bobby Wagner released by the Rams after one year in Los Angeles yesterday. There were some and I'm using air quotes here reports of Pittsburgh having interest in Wagner, but just given the need there at inside linebacker, um, there's a conversation to be had there. Alex, I think you have a better chance of being signed to play tackle for the Steelers in 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 2023 than Taylor Lewan does. Uh, My knee is healthier, so I think I, I'm with you there. Right now, I worry about your uh, worry about your hand usage and your arm length. And is that where it starts? Yeah, arm length and size <laughs> probably is before the hand usage and the technique of it. But I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you uh, out in space probably don't move all that well. <laughs> Not uh, in the phone booth either. Don't yeah, move well in general. Yeah, uh, I, I just, I mean, we've we've said this pretty much from. I understand why he's doing, why he has taken the approach that he has, and also, you know, he's obviously friends with Jersey Jerry, and you know, helps helps pump uh, that aspect of Jersey Jerry's uh, dream. It would have to be a mighty, mighty, mighty cheap contract uh i think for the uh for the Steelers to consider signing taylor lawan on let's say a one-year deal uh it really really would i mean you know back-to-back seasons with knee issues i mean the fact that he's getting he he he, he was uh cut with a failed physical designation the fact that he even stated on his pod i don't know if i would have been that that up front right. uh Yesterday, I mean, uh, look, we, we 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 get on players all the time, or you know, about transparency and and upfront. There's some things I think that you better not that you just should not reveal anyway. Not that teams aren't going to find this stuff out anyway, but uh, uh, I mean, he said he's got to get his knee right still. So, and that's been kind of, I guess, a frustrating factor for he. If he gets ten million dollars from a team. This offseason for, 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 for one year or average yearly value, God bless them. Uh, and and shame on the team that gives it to them or, or be be they, they better be prepared. You know, yeah. I, I, if you because he, he said he would he wouldn't play less for 10 million. He said that a while back. 
any deal he gets, I have to think it has to be heavily incentive based and they'd be not likely to be earned because he only played two games last year and it's betting on that health and protecting yourself if he doesn't. In Pittsburgh, outside of Trubisky and quarterbacks, they really don't do incentive type deals. Right, right. Uh, yeah, it had to be like a playoff. Uh, I would think some sort of playoff $250,000 bonus, you know. Even building it incentive wise, how much, you know, how much is that thing going to be leveraged incentive wise? You know, you saw, you saw you saw Juju's deal and even that, though, most of the chunk of it, though, was guaranteed, you know, essentially guaranteed money for him. Sure, that's true. But I mean, I'm just trying to spitball. How would any team, I think, even try to smartly structure that? Yeah, there's got to be some level that isn't it can't be 90 percent incentives, but right. You know, it's got to be, I think, heavier than than usual, just given the age and the injury history. Yeah, the guy's 32. He's got a bunch of knee issues. He's not even 100% sure if he's going to play next year. He's contemplated retirement. What's not to like? No, you're not going to. The draft class is strong. If you want to upgrade a left tackle, fine. It's not going to be Taylor Lewan. Yeah, I will be absolutely shocked if it's him, if he's signed by the Steelers this offseason. Uh, Bobby Wagner, look, I mean, uh, he's one of those older guys in the NFL you know, like Jason Peters and all that, man, you just say, man, how's this guy continue to get it done at his age and the level of his play? Uh, you're in, you're out. And uh, he, uh, Bobby Wagner is a guy that uh, obviously uh, a year ago at this time was, uh, was, was let go by the Seahawks for, for cap purposes. It didn't take him too terribly long to land uh, with the Rams on a, you know, a uh, deal that put p- pretty nice money in his pocket there. He went out there and ended up being a second team all pro, uh, tackled everything in sight pretty much. Didn't he lead the league in tackles or was right? I mean, he had to be out there right at their top, top five in total tackles, didn't he? I'd have to check. I don't know. I know that Nick Bolton, I don't think he led the league, but he had 180. Did Wagner have more than 180 tackles this year? I'm I can, fixing to find out right here. He had 140. So he didn't lead the league. Uh, let's see. Regular season, combined tackles. Uh, he was, where is he? Down probably 10th yeah, or 11th. About, about 11th or 12th at 100, 140 tackles. Though. When's the last time the Steelers have had anybody uh, that played linebacker that hmm. re- registered 140 tackles uh, in the season? Look, I, I here's what I'm saying. I think Bobby Wagner. Might still have one more year left in him here at this point. Uh, I do think, though, because he was a second team All Pro, because he was able to play, you know, I think in every game, because he was able to register some of the stats that he did, he's still not going to come cheap. I don't think, you know. Sure. Uh, and you know, if, if you were a team that was right there on the on the on the cusp and say, "Man, we got to kick down," you know, we've been to the playoffs, we got to make a run this year we need that one piece maybe uh in the middle of our defense to maybe make that happen maybe that's a guy that you go after but i don't think the Steelers are, are in that situation right now to be quite honest with you uh, even if you had him for one year you you know one year is all you're going to get out of them uh, i think the price tag i think their cap situation uh everything involved just everything looking at it from every angle makes you think that there's probably no way that the Steelers are going to land Bobby Wagner. Sure. And although it's a new GM assistant GM, the 30 plus year old defensive player, how often do they go sign that guy in free agency? Never. Right. So I just don't see this one happening for, for all the reasons you laid out there. Um, and At I, some I, point they got to address this damn thing during a, uh, in draft. a draft, yes. you know, all these free agent swings have not worked out. And I know Devin Bush didn't work out either, but the draft overall, younger, cheaper, better to scout. Yeah, I, because it, like you said, even if they were to sign Wagner one-year deal this time next year, we're talking about, okay, right. who's the next inside linebacker? So uh, just an annoying game to play. So I really can't see this one happening. And again, the, the reports last year, there was one thing from a DD, which was not even a report. It was just nah. her own opinion. Then Jordan Schultz said Pittsburgh had interest that was the last, the first and last time anyone ever mentioned it. So if that was even true and who the heck knows, the interest seemed to be pretty faint. Yeah. And that felt like kind of a pile on report at the time. I remember back. Mm -hmm. Right. So pretty, pretty thin connection there, but you know, under understanding the talent still there, the fit would make sense at some level. And so it was worth at least us talking about. 
And look, hey, Mike Thomas talked glowingly about this, about Bobby Wagner over the years. And why wouldn't you? You know? Yeah, I think everyone has. Uh, uh, there, but, uh, uh, push comes to shove with this thing. I, you know, I understand everybody gets excited this time of year about every, and there, there are a lot more cuts around the league coming too. So, uh, uh, I just, both these guys that we just mentioned in Taylor, Taylor Lewan and Bobby Wagner, eh, I just don't see it. Yeah, I don't see it either. So, uh, we'll see what other cuts come in and we'll see what Pittsburgh does. And those should come in the next couple of weeks. All right, Dave, anything else here you want to talk about? Again, pretty, pretty light show today, but things will pick up, uh, you know, pretty good in the coming weeks. I want to go back to taking your temperature more on, uh, on Cameron Sutton real quick. I'm, I'm trying to get an article out today, uh, on this, uh, based on, and what it is, it's a, it's going to be an, uh, advanced stats, great slash grades, uh, look at the potential contract value of Cameron Sutton versus the uh, versus every cornerback currently under contract earning ten million or more a season, and I think there are twenty two of those right now. Uh, what we did is we had uh, Clayton. Uh, uh, who's on been our staff is getting really, really good at, 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 at using, you know, uh, uh, you know, some of these stats programs and manipulating them and, and putting them into charts and stuff like, I shouldn't say manipulate them, but in formatting them mm-hmm. and just running great studies with them and all I put him on this project yesterday and he knocked it out, you know, fairly, fairly quick. And we brainstormed on a couple of ways to maybe kind of rank, uh, these guys uh, on top of it based on things like, and this is over a three-year span, Alex, okay? This would be from uh, 20, 21, and 22 seasons, uh, finding out like combined uh, 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 cover, uh, pass coverage and run defense grades on uh, PFF, uh, snaps played, uh, quarterback rating against uh, yards per completion allowed total targets, all those kind of things. And and what we did is we've come up with two kind of graphs of two different looks at all of these players uh, over the past three years. uh, And then tried to pull some sort of ranking for both of those charts out of that overall. And, Uh, and, and, and my post is going to kind of be built around that, but, but I sent all of it because I want to, because I wanted to kind of outside eyes on this, uh, as an aspect of, you know, where, where would you see this player in, in, in relation to long story short, I don't want to, I don't want to give away the, uh, you know, the, the, the whole post in a, uh, stuttering diatribe here, but. I, I still come away with this from this study. Now, look, either you're a fan of PFF or you're not a fan of PFF or you're only a fan of PFF when it fits your narrative or your, you know, those kind of things there. Uh, say what you will, but I think they, I think top to bottom overall, they do a great job at PFF. Uh, they do miss stuff. There's stuff that grades on, on maybe a per game basis sometimes that I scratch my head on. Uh, I think you probably do as well, Alex, but I think as a whole, they do a pretty good job. Uh, My takeaway from all of this still is that I think Cameron Sutton should be a top 15 highest paid cornerback in the league right now. And what with the data that you collected reinforces that point? What I, again, I don't want you to give it away, but you're saying that data is kind of going to validate that, that notion. Yeah, I think the data is going to say going to come away with look he's uh what do we say 12th overall in one set of rankings and I think night and this is compared on this isn't league wide. This is compared to 22 other cornerbacks uh in the NFL earning 10 million or more, okay? Okay. Uh uh per season. This is the study is based on only those players compared over the last three years compared to Cameron Sutton. Okay. Okay. Uh, and he, he finished, uh, well, what I say 12th and one, I think 19th overall in the other. Uh, and, uh, 
the 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 one that he finished uh 12th in or 11th in uh was more related to uh raw statistics like uh off of pro football reference and stuff like uh passer rating against and uh yards uh yards per catch allowed and those kind of things there uh just looking at it totally and biasedly from an analytical uh an advanced statistics standpoint i come away with him feeling that he should be at, at, at a minimum 15th 15th highest paid cornerback in the league and if 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 that were to be true the way the, the this this list of cornerbacks sits right now it would have to slightly top 13.3333 million per year okay uh, and now and now i good. do now personally i feel the 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 play and the tape matches that assessment as well too yeah, I thought in 2022, especially Sutton had his best year, his second time, second year as a as a full outside corner, and I thought he got more comfortable and and played well. It just goes back to the things I've talked about. You know, are you comfortable paying Sutton and declaring him the top guy in that room? You don't have to go draft a, another top end corner to be that true number one, quote unquote, lockdown type of guy. Would you consider shadowing? Sutton with their top receivers. Are you going to play Sutton in the slot on third down and have James Pierre on the outside covering their top receiver? Typically, if you're going to pay a guy that kind of money, you're either going to do those things in shadowing and you're, and you're not going to do those things as, as like, you know, playing Sutton as the rotational safety or the slot corner or something like that in those big money downs. So that's my whole point about Sutton is if you want to pay him that amu- amount of money, fine, but act accordingly, act like you're paying him that amount of money. Okay, uh, and you know maybe that will end up being the buzzkill with his market value uh, across the NFL. So say, look, you know this is a guy that you know is a one-sided player that occasionally he's super smart and can 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 give you obviously some is is real versatile from a position aspect, but he's not a guy that's going that that you're going to sign for thirteen and a half million that's going to travel. I mean, some some teams might might be able to view him as that, you know, but, uh, you know, maybe that might be a, a, a highly determining factor in his overall market value this offseason. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, let me ask you, you pay this guy top 15, 13 and a half, almost 14 million dollars on, on third and 10. Do you want him in the slot and playing the hook zone or do you want this guy on the outside covering a number one receiver? You got to give me more, more of the math there. What's going to happen during a draft? Who am I going to get? You know, there's a lot of very based on based on what we know right now at this moment. uh, I'd be fine with 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 paying him thirteen point three and putting him wherever he's most most comfortable. Uh, In other words, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bat a die. I don't think if he stayed playing on, on the side that he plays on. Okay. And, and that's fair. I mean, I get that. Obviously you want to do what's best for the defense, best for the team, but I do think it changes a bit when you pay that guy, that amount of money, you know, when you pay a receiver a ton of money, you better get your return on investment. You better be at the focal point of your offense. When you pay a cornerback a ton of money, he better be maximizing that value on every single snap. I do think that equation changes some. Now I will tell you this. And, uh, uh, I I could have heavily influenced these these numbers here by only taking the two years the last two years of data uh, that that we used in this study instead of three because let me tell you in 2020 uh, Cameron Sutton's run defense grade was miserable. He's playing more in the slot that year, I guess, too, right? I think. Seems that seems right, right? That sounds right, yeah. So, you know, I wonder how much that's maybe impacting. I think he's improved as a tackler. I think his run defense has, has improved. Too. But, but yeah, certainly, you know, I'm sure that 2020 wasn't as good. Now, look, we I could sit here and uh, uh, people, you know, you're cherry picking. Okay, yeah, you're you're exactly right. Uh, I could probably go through each one of these cornerbacks and say, man, 2000, you know, that, that guy's numbers got dinged a little bit there by a uh, PFF grade in coverage in two years ago, you know? Uh, but I, I thought, I felt like a three year span 
was a pretty good span to use because a that's you know technically when when Sutton started playing a lot more snaps right you know right uh, on top of it there but uh, uh, I I will say that man I, I started I, in fact I thought Clayton had it plotted wrong when I when I when I saw it on his plot uh, of of the chart that has both the X and the Y axis being uh, the uh, run. Uh, run grades and the uh, pass coverage grades. I thought, man, that, that can't be right. Uh, mm-hmm. And I went and looked and man, I mean, you to be specific here, let's see, let's see if I can pull it up real quick. Uh, I want to say Cam Sutton, what, what year did I say? 2020, right? Yes. Uh, run defense grade. I hope it didn't log me out here. No, it didn't. Uh, run defense grade for Cameron Sutton. On 552 snaps played that year was 29.8. Mm. That was 2020. Yeah, that was whatever Mike Hilton missed time and Sutton played more in the slot. And then the last two, two years, he's been more of an outside corner. All right. So, uh, you know, when you're when you're using three grades and you're using the average. Yeah. Now, let's let's look at uh, Sutton's 2021. And once again, these are courtesy of Pro Football Focus. And if you hate Pro Football Focus, just go ahead and click off on or, or jump ahead in this podcast and all because some people are just biased against it. Some people, you know, uh, are fine by by 71.6 was his uh, run defense grade in the regular season in 2021. And 2022, that number was 73.6. So, you know, b- the last two years alone, he's probably considered one of the better run defensive cornerbacks in the NFL. Yeah, and I'm sure that switch from slot to outside, a little less demanding, probably helped a little bit with the uh, the jump in number there. All right. So, I mean, look, th- this is just one other way, off-season way to look at it uh, here. You know, and uh, it's it's not conclusive. It You know, p- people might read this and say that's a little wonky and you know, uh, the, the way you went about did doing this, but, uh, my takeaway just from the, from, from the advanced statistics side that we use there in both, you know, raw statistics from pro football reference and, and, and grades and, and stuff along the lines from, from PFF is that this, this, this guy belongs in, uh, to be a top 15 highest paid cornerback in the NFL. Yeah, like I said, it'll be the the number I'll be watching the closest because, you know, I think the market, I think that's well rationed and well reasoned, but there's still something in my gut. And maybe it's me wishing more than thinking that Sutton can take a little bit less and whatever it's worth. And I take these with big grains of salt, but I think even PFF, if we're talking them, have a pretty conservative contract projection on Sutton. I think it's even below 10 million, which feels way too low, but some of the projections around the league have him. Uh, you know, below that 13.333 mark. And so I really want to see what that number comes in at. Uh, let's see. I mean, if he was below 10 million, I mean, you're talking easily outside the top 20 highest paid corners, you know. Sure. What does PFF project his contract? I know the Brad over there, and I don't know what it, what you think of him or what people think of him, but I believe it was around – I want to say nine to 10 million was their contract projection. And one of the projections that they did uh, for free agency a while back or re- relatively recently, I should say. Uh, when did he write that? It was about, uh, three a couple years. weeks ago. Uh, let's see. Sutton is projected by, I'm reading something on our site here. Sutton is projected by PFF to get a three year deal with 25.5 million with 15 and a half guarantees. So what's 25? Point five divided by three eight and a half all right eight and a half that man if you uh, that warrants a per, that warrants a uh, a day on the calendar being named omar conde or something <laughs> I, I i think if you got him for ha- eight and a half million right but i assume pff's doing that based off their metrics and grading to try to suss out a projected contract now even i think that's a little bit conservative but if we're talking pff and their numbers that's how they're kind of viewing Sutton financially. All right. What does it say about PFF? If he comes in at 13, 13.3, you know, yeah, uh, it might mean they're, or, or even 12 and a half, you know, sure. I mean, it would mean they're missing the mark, but 
I'm just, you know, since we're talking about the data set of what the PFF numbers are and a little bit of what PFR says, just to kind of try to wrap that together. So, I, you know, something in my gut, and, and maybe this is me again, wishing, hoping, thinking, thinks that Sutton will end up in that $11 million range as opposed to 13.3 plus. When William Jackson III was in more in his prime, was he a better cornerback than Cameron Sutton is now? It's hard for me to say. We it's not like watched, I yeah, studied we, yeah, William but, Jackson. But what does but it feel like? I I really what? I really don't know. I, I'm trying to think about a gut reaction right now. No, I, I think I mean if, if Sutton can play at the level he played last year, then no. But will Sutton play at that really high level every year going forward? Right, because uh, William Jackson the third. He got him a deal that at least you know, on paper averaged him thirteen and a half million. You know, right. And I go back to Charvarius Ward, and I think somebody disagreed with me yesterday, and that's fine. But you know, some I, I think that Sutton's as good, if not a better player, than Ward was his final year in Kansas City. So, you know, I, I understand from a market standpoint, you're trying to beat the guy uh, that just got paid, and the cap goes up, and so those things would indicate that Sutton should get more than what Ward got. But you know, maybe he takes a little bit less, and maybe the Maybe the interest isn't quite there with Sutton as it was with the Traverius Ward. And look, I have been known in the past to kind of overvalue by a million and a half, two million. You know, uh, you know, th- th- this time of year, I've I've missed. I have been r- 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 <laughs> r- wrong before. Uh, it just it, it really. Uh, I I would still consider he, uh, Sutton getting around you know twelve and a half as a win. Uh, in, 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 in kind of my viewpoint, wh- where is that breaking point with him? Once again, is it 10 million with you? Is it, it, it where you become a lot more comfortable with where he would play versus the number? Yeah, personally, I'd like to be around 11, 10 and a half, 11 million. I feel like three years, 33 million sounds like solid to me. That's still a substantial pay race for him. Even if you want to d- debate about it, is that market value, the going rate? It's still a big increase, and obviously we talk about what, what's guaranteed and signing bonuses and all those things. So there'll be a lot of money in his pocket for sure for you know the next couple of years. All right, once again, I'll be trying to piece this together. Maybe I'll get it together today, maybe sometime over the weekend. It's it's not going to, I don't think, influence a lot of people's. Uh, most people have their mind made up but that, that listen to this at this point. They're either saying, yeah, you know what, Dave's right. He probably – does deserve to get 13 and a half or right around that number. Uh, or there there's people on the other end of the spectrum that are, that, that are saying uh, eight and a half because, because that's the, the way lower number. And they just don't view Cameron Sutton as that spectacular of a player, which if that's your viewpoint on that, that, you know, that that's obviously fine. I just want to let people more into the world of, of the different ways that I try to look at this when, sure. when it comes, comes to contract values. So, and, and I think most fans would agree. They want to see Cam Sutton return. I want to see Cam mm-hmm. Sutton return. He's a valuable guy. If you lose him, you know, putting aside what I talked about, if you pay this guy, you know, 13 and a half million, how much do you kind of move him around? But certainly brought so much versatility. I just did that uh, inversion breakdown of their cover two, cover three inversions, and Cam Sutton played such a key role in in in, in a lot of those things, and allowed Minka to to spin down and move around quite a bit. Um, because really, in terms of guys that can play the the post free safety, Edmonds doesn't really do it. Casey can kind of do it, but Sutton played that quite a bit and allowed Minka to spin down sometimes. So uh, there's a lot of value there, and certainly losing him would be a considerable loss for the secondary. Later is is potentially his ability to maybe move to 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 a free safety spot down the road. It, could you foresee that happening with him at some point during his uh, during the remainder of his NFL career? Maybe not necessarily with the Steelers. I mean, potentially when cornerbacks start to lose some of their speed and Sutton was never blessed with great straight line speed. They, there's that conversation about switching to free safety, but that's still so. Right. Far down the road, it's, you know, obviously you're paying this guy now to, to be an outside corner. All right. Uh, yet another conversation about Sutton, but, uh, yeah. uh, you know, we, we're, we're only two and a half, not even that weeks away from probably figuring out what's going to happen with him. Yeah. And the combine should start to kick off those talks. Typically in Pittsburgh, I think even Zach Gentry made a comment recently that that's whenever Pittsburgh starts talking with agents and you actually start trying to work towards a deal and what a framework could look like. So it's 
it's going to be quiet for now until about next week when the combine kicks off. All right, we're going to have uh, Jonathan, the great Jonathan Hightrader and the great Joe Clark uh, in Indianapolis covering things for us this year. Uh, very excited about that. And Khan talks on Tuesday. Tuesday, 1030 a.m. Eastern time. Omar Khan will speak to the media. And hopefully that'll get streamed live. And once again, we'll have those guys there all week in Indianapolis uh, covering uh, covering the combine. You and I have already got the uh, uh, the underwear Olympics charts set up there and uh, looking forward to doing that with you again as well, too. It's going to be a busy week uh, next week uh, for sure when it comes to uh, kind of draft related stuff. And it will be good to hear from 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 Omar Khan again as well, too. Uh, what else do we got to talk about today, Alex? Anything? One more thing I forgot, and this was a, a report from the trip from Tim Benz yesterday that uh, according to a source that he has, quarterback Mason Rudolph would consider a return to Pittsburgh under the right circumstances, still basically saying that he's going to test free agency first and look around, see what other opportunities he has. But in the right situation, which my read of that based on some of the things that Benz wrote was, you know, Mitch Trubisky not being here, whether that's a trade, a cut. Whatever the case, if, if Rudolph were to, to, to look around the league, really have nothing out there, Trubisky's gone, and Rudolph could return to Pittsburgh as that clear-cut number two behind Kenny Pickett, the reporting is he would uh, would certainly consider that. So that's a guy that we thought basically guaranteed to be gone. I'm still confident he's going to be gone, but Ben's is saying that if the uh, stars align, that Rudolph could return. I just think that's Rudolph saying the right things. First and foremost, why would you want to completely burn any type of a bridge whatsoever? Uh, I, I, just, I just feel like it, uh, feel like that's the polite thing to say. Yeah, I, you know, if the if situ, you know, you never know how things turn out. The right situation presented itself. Sure, I'd sign back. But uh, I'll tell you this: if, if if he did sign back, it would be because Mitch is not part of that equation. And on top of it, I think it would probably have to be along the lines that we talked about this the other day, one of those four year qualifying contracts uh, on, on top of it. That would that would put a little bit more money in his pocket and it'd be a one year deal It would come with a little bit of a re- reduced salary cap. It'd be more in line technically what the Steelers have done over the years with with the backup quarterback position. Uh, as far as from from a pay aspect, I, I can't foresee even him getting three, three and a half, four million dollars. You can't. This, nah, I, not, not, I mean, not, he, not he just got paid. That. He just but, got paid. That was the this, this the one year extension he signed was worth how much? Three, three and a half. Yeah, I mean, it was obviously a lot more than than it probably should have been. But I mean, they did it once. And I, now I he's going to be the number I two. I don't think they'd do it again. I think they would. I mean, you got any backup veteran guy with some experience isn't going to be at the minimum. I mean, I think you're going to have to pay that guy a little bit to 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 be your your backup if you want a competent guy that's played a bit on Sundays. Uh, I think he would stand to get more from somewhere somewhere else on top of it. What was his contract? Sure. Yeah, I mean, he could. I, I, the way that I view that story was like that's a last resort type thing. If if everything else breaks wrong, there is no free agent in, interest, nothing that can really allow him to compete for a or really kind of be a number two. Um, somewhere and Trubisky's gone and Rudolph kind of has nowhere else to turn, then yeah, I'll consider coming back to Pittsburgh, but that kind of feels like a break glass in case of a emergency situation. Uh, let's see. Uh, gave him a signing bonus of 2.08 million as part of the extension. The result of that, uh, uh, earn a total of three million in Rudolph's 2020. What was his uh, average yearly value, though? Because he had all, you know, even though it was a low old money amount, uh, that still factors into. Hold on, uh, he had an AP, a, APY of uh, four point nine eight five million when all was said and done. There. Yeah, so they could. I could get that guy three and a half, four million if they just gave him five million in new money a year ago. Okay. Or I guess two years ago, because it was 2021 as an extension. But yeah, to be number two quarterback. I mean, I, you know, who the heck knows? Again, I still think Rudolph's going to gonna go somewhere else. I think obviously he felt like he got, and probably justifiably so, consistently the short end of the stick in Pittsburgh and wants to go explore something else and, and start anew. But um, again, I think it will be that, that fallback option if everything kind of goes wrong for him and what he hopes will happen in free agency. 
Okay. I think they got themselves in a little bit of hole, uh, at, you know, and that's why when that extension happened, it happened when it did. And, and, you know, they always like to stay a year ahead with a guy under contract at least. And I, I think a lot of factors paid into that. Uh, aspect of, uh, 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 of them getting that deal done with him. But we'll, once again, I, I think this is a moot, uh, um, um, a moot point here because mm-hmm. uh, I think he's going to be gone in a couple weeks. Any chance Trubisky is traded? Those are not talks, but it's been it's being discussed by some of the media types a bit more. And I think even that Trib report made a reference way down in the article to a potential trade there. The only way, and I mentioned this before on a podcast uh, episode with you, the only way I see that happening is if the Steelers uh, decide to to eat, uh, agree to eat, let's say three million of that base salary of his, right, which makes just makes no sense to me to do that because the well, money I mean, that, cap cap savings is cap savings. And, and no, I, I know, but well, I, I say that okay, you eat three million, then you go sign a veteran backup for three million or whatever the number is. Now you've eaten up six million, you know. How much are you really saving sure. at that point for your backup quarterback situation? But once again, I'm thinking about the other side as well, too, uh, 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 of who would trade for a flat out eight million dollar base salary. Right. No, I'm with you there. I, I I struggle to find that name. I mean, to be that because Trubisky's not going to start anywhere next year, any any team, because you, know, you got a couple for Asian quarterbacks and Carr and Aaron Rodgers may be on the move and a really strong quarterback class. It's not as desperate as things seem to be last year. I think quarterbacks got got a bit overpaid last year because there was nothing really that great in the draft. And, you know, the free agent, you know, class wasn't particularly strong. So different equation this year. So I, I'm with you there. But, you know, to, to see Jerry Dulac say maybe a third to me just seems way out to lunch. Yeah, I'm thinking more of a fifth or something like yeah, that. But right. uh, hey, here's the thing. Uh, if, if a team were to trade for him, uh, A, you know, if I if I'm that GM trading for him, then I, it'd be hard to get more than a fifth out of me. And then on top of it, if I was going to take on uh, that full eight million uh, uh, salary and incentives and all like that to come along with it, it, it would be because I just drafted another kid here, and I want I want Trubisky to keep the seat warm. Uh, the way that uh, that he did with Pittsburgh, and, and long story short, if we get to week, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, and we're out of it, Trubisky's out, and that that kid's going in. I'm I'm getting him some some work there. So Trubisky could be going. The only way I envision it happening at another team taking on that eight million is for him to be back in a situation that he was uh, with the Steelers last year. Yeah, he's a real Bill Murray Groundhog Day situation. Wake up and do the same thing again. Yeah, I'm with you there. I mean, look, if they got God bless them, uh, if, if they could trade him and get uh, get that salary off the books and in addition, get a fifth round draft pick out of it. Hell yeah, I, I would do it. Personally. Sure. Oh, yeah, I would, too. Yeah, I mean, I would cut Trubisky, you know, failing anything else and go sign a, a cheaper veteran type guy. But even, even a six round pick, you know, you, know, you don't have a fifth or a six right now. That would kind of help bridge that gap. Um, if I could trade his full salary and get a six, I do that tomorrow. And look, once again, I, I was slam dunk prior to Art Rooney talking a few weeks ago. I was thinking, man, this guy's this guy's going to get cut. But uh, you know, usually when Art Rooney says things like that, unless he was just posturing there, which you know could could indeed be the be the case, and 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 trying to retain whatever potential trade talk value. Uh, that that may exist with Trubisky, uh, I I was I was really 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 thinking that it, it was pretty much going to be a slam dunk situation where Trubisky would be cut. Sure. So for me right now, I'm going to assume Mitch Trubisky remains a Steeler until proven wrong. That's my approach with Trubisky. Here's something I did a math on because uh, so I'm starting to get a few people hollering at me on Twitter and whatnot. You know, what if you what if you restructured Trubisky and added on the four avoidable years, you know, uh, which I, a, I'd be surprised if the Steelers did do that, but, and, and look, maybe Mitch don't want to do it either, but I mean, if he wants to get paid $8 million, eight, you know, it doesn't matter how, how it's broken up, you know, uh, that way, if the Steelers did go that route, big, big, if, 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 uh, and if, if, if Trubisky agreed to do it, uh, the team would save roughly, I think, five million dollars in cap space by by in 2023. However, comma, you are setting yourself up for, you know, 
four million uh, in, in in dead money to be there in 2024. Yeah, that's the rub with the avoidable years. Yeah, I mean, if Pittsburgh wants to do that, I'm good with that. But it was Colbert that said, kind of put the kibosh on voidable years in the future, right? Is that right. Colbert that said that? Khan, I guess, has never officially said that, although he said last year, I think in his opening press conference after being named GM, the structure of contracts basically won't change. And I assume that that includes voidable years. So not something... I'm expecting. Let me give you just one more thought on Trubisky because there is the elephant in the room of does Trubisky want to remain a Pittsburgh Steeler? Probably doesn't. He certainly does not love the way things happen in, in 22, but there's a case to be made that being in Pittsburgh is the best thing for him as opposed to going to a new team, new system, the uncertainty there to make $8 million as this team's backup and probably a guy that's going to play football in 23. I mean, he played in almost a quarter of the games after getting benched in week four last year when Kenny Pickett got hurt against what Tampa and Baltimore, et cetera, started against Carolina Trubisky did. So he'll be playing next year. You can almost take that to the bank. Um, so to be $8 million, to be a backup, to play some, and then maybe try to have a couple good outings and see what you can do next off season. No, he's not going to start anywhere else. No, no other team's going to give him the, the green light to be that day one starter the way that Pittsburgh did last year. So at best, you're going to go to another team to be a backup and be in that same position, potentially for less money if you get cut. So I know that Trubisky probably isn't happy with getting benched and the way things turn out. But to me, staying in Pittsburgh might be the best thing for him. Yeah, well, I mean, especially from a monetary factor, right? Yeah, well, and a chance to to be in a system that you know second year in, not having to learn a new system again after being in Buffalo and then being in Pittsburgh and then being in the new place. That's a lot to take in. So yeah, financially and even opportunity, I think there's, there's, the Pittsburgh's attractive. Yeah, but but uh, he could also wind up playing 33 snaps like he did in Buffalo two two years ago, and then nobody's going to ever consider him as ever being. Uh, he he will officially be lumped in to the Andy Daltons and the. Uh, uh, of of the world, right? Right, but is he going to go be a, a week one starter with any other team? Even if, if even if he were cut tomorrow, do you see that happen? I mean, once again, it goes back to if if a what is the team's draft plans? Uh, can can he keep? Is there an organization out there that would want him to keep the seat warm for yeah. six six to eight weeks? That's that's the only. You're not going to go. I, I don't think. You're going to go to a team and say, man, we're just a quarterback away here. We can make a run here. Let's go get Mitch Trubisky. Right. I, I just don't see him being a week one starter for any team in, unless there was an injury that happened, you know, mid camp or something like that. So to me, he's going to be a number two, no matter where he goes, might as well be in Pittsburgh. You're going to make the most amount of money. And again, Kenny Pickett, you know, had some injuries last year. There's always a chance you don't play at all, but I like Trubisky's odds of playing considering he played again in about one quarter of the games after getting benched last year. Okay, we'll see how that plays out here in the next uh, couple of weeks. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, Dave, I think it's going to wrap things up. Let's get to a couple of reader emails and close out today's show. Before we do, Alex, the NFL season has come to an end, but at my bookie, the opportunities to win don't stop. Did you watch that XFL game last night, at least the fourth quarter of it? I didn't, but it seemed like I watched the, the game-winning touchdown, so that was a – a good end there. That ended up being a pretty entertaining game over there. I, I'm so far. I'm I'm I've been impressed with what I've seen. I think there's another game tonight as well too, and I bet I have that thing on while I'm watching tape here. But uh, uh, I, I I was impressed by that game a, a, as a whole, especially the fourth quarter of that uh, XFL game uh, last night. Uh, whether you bet to earn or to make the games more exciting, my bookie gives you the most for your money with a redesigned deposit bonus. Getting started is easy. Just visit mybookie.ag and use our promo code TERRIBLE to claim a bonus up to $2,000. Use promo code terrible to get a deposit bonus that gives you extra funds to play with all the way up to two thousand dollars with my bookie bet on nba nhl ufc or play for a share of big cash prizes in the weekly online blackjack tournaments that they have with so many brands to choose from you need a platform that makes it simple to bet and win like my bookie bet anything anytime anywhere with my bookie all right, Dave, let's get to some read emails to close out today's show. All right, let's uh, – and we will be monitoring the Daniel Jeremiah uh, uh, pre-combine 
media session today. So I'm sure we'll be writing about that at some point here. Simon Short writes in. Dave and Alex, happy Friday. Thank you both for all your work that you do. I particularly enjoyed Dave's solo cap podcast and would definitely buy a book. Cap question for you, he has. For these players drafted in 2020 that are eligible for extensions this offseason, what happens to the fourth year of the contract? Should they sign an extension? Does it get ripped up and they create a new salary cap charge for the year? Or does any new money based salary signing bonus proration get added to the existing numbers? All right, let's uh, let's take Alex Highsmith for an example there. That's a great working situation uh, that the Steers will be looking at probably this offseason here. OK, well, uh, what uh, what 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 stays in place? You know, it, let's say you got a guy going into the final year of his rookie deal like you do with with with, with Alex Highsmith here. What absolutely has to stay in place is what proration, what what previous bonus proration is already on the books uh, prior to that. So right now you're dealing uh, with a guy in 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 Alex Highsmith that in 2023. Uh, from left over from his uh, 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 rookie signing bonus is $208,073. So that does not move out of the year. Now, Alex Highsmith's base salary right now, because of the proven performance escalator uh, raise that he's going to get this offseason, is $2.743 million. So what you could essentially do now, here, here's the thing. That becomes that money, that two point seven four three million that that Alex Highsmith is now scheduled to make. That doesn't go. That doesn't just mag- magically go away as part of this new deal. It's considered old money. So, let's say, for example, you worked out. I'm just going to don't nobody freak out. I'm just going to throw out here fifteen million dollars per year uh, for a total of. Five years. What's the math on that? What's five times 15? Uh, That's 75. $75 million, right? Uh, so let's say, uh, okay, Alex, we want you to sign this uh, five year, uh, $75 million contract. Well, the total value, the, that additional $2.743 million would then get lumped in to the rest of that deal. So it would essentially become a, 77 and this is assuming that you're agreeing on this is the base you know this is his new money average of of of, of 15 million dollars a year uh what you would see is that the, to- the total value of that deal would end up being what would it be 77.743 million would be the total value of that deal now what you would do is you would probably work you can either leave his base salary alone as part of that deal or you could lower it to the to 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 the veteran minimum based on his credited seasons and all like that. So essentially you you could rip up the structure of that base that that base salary that he's currently scheduled to earn a 2.743 million, but it's not like it magically uh uh goes away. That old mo- that old money amount would get factored into the total value of the extension. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's a good explainer and one that certainly may become relevant with Alex Highsmith uh, this summer. Now, look, the bonus proration, as we just mentioned, there uh, stays on the book of, of, of two hundred eight thousand seventy three dollars, and then obviously, let's say you gave him an eighteen million dollar signing bonus uh, as part of that deal that we just discussed. And 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 the deal was for four more years on top of 2023. Well, then you would take that 18. Uh, what did I say? That bonus was 18 million, uh, and mm-hmm. divide it by five. You would add another 3.6 million dollars in proration, bonus proration into the 2023 column, in addition to that 208. 1073. So bonus proration never it always stays in the year that it that it was allotted to as part of the bonus proration there. Uh I hope that it that better explains it for Simon. Yeah, no, I think he did. Um my so, yeah, wife that, that's... my wife just gave me the gun to the head. 
uh, signal there. Maybe something where we go back and you gotta listen to it twice, but yeah, listen to it and uh, I think people will understand. My wife doesn't understand my fascination and why I'm so good with the cap, but uh, here we are. <laughs> uh, Lee Greenspan writes in, hi, hey, Dave and Ox, if the Steelers can't get a deal done with Cam Sutton, do you think they will use the franchise tag on him or potentially the transition tag? Lee, uh, listen to the episode on, what was it? Wednesday, right? Yes. Uh, all your answers to that question without us repeating here are in the Wednesday episode of the terrible podcast here. Uh, we can answer that very shortly by saying, no, they're not going to no. do either of those things. Yeah. There, there's your uh, answer. Uh, this one says, don't forget about DeMarvin Leal from Taylor Carpenter from Athens, Ohio. Uh, I'll try to keep this brief. So not upset uncle Dave. So here it is. A lot of talk about not having any defensive line talent depth aside from Hayward, but I think people are overlooking what the Steelers have in DeMarvin Leal, six foot four with 33 inch arms. He fits closely to what the Steelers look for in three, four ends. Uh, I believe the Steelers plan for him is to add weight and be a rotational defensive end in 2022, but injuries forced him into a role. He's probably not best suited for. He lacks the required burst and agility to play outside linebacker at a high level. In my opinion, he says, my question is to you guys is if Leal is able to add weight, get stronger and play somewhere north of 300 pound mark. Can he become our starting three, four end uh, of the future opposite Cam Hayward? He says, I think the Steelers and Kevin Colbert were extremely high on Leal following the draft. Uh, post-wrap press conferences. Colbert stated that it, they had a very high grade on Leal, and they made a point to repeat himself, indicating to me that they may have viewed him as a second round or even a very late first round prospect. He says, what are your thoughts? Additionally, he has a PS in here for Alex. Tell Alex to make sure he has a photo of him with a dog on his dating profile. It will increase his odds of finding Mrs. Wright dramatically. He says that's an online dating cheat code for you, Alex. Yeah, now I need a dog. So if anyone wants to loan their dog out, that would uh, that would help. You can go to George Costanza route, right? Maybe you can Photoshop one in these days. <laughs> I probably could. Heck, they got Photoshops of... Uh, uh, Bobby Wagner in a Steelers uniform and Taylor Lewan <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a Steelers uniform and maybe I photoshopped myself in a Steelers uniform. Huh? Ah, maybe yeah, that holding worked. a dog. Yeah, in yeah, a Steelers uniform. yeah. Maybe maybe that worked. Maybe we need to get somebody on photoshopping in a dog in the uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Alex's uh, dating profile. Maybe that'll help there. Uh, look, um, Look, I, I, I don't think anybody's forgetting about DeMarvin Leal. It's just we got to find out what he is uh, and and if indeed he can load up and, and, and carry that 300-pound uh, mark and, and become an area. It's not so much that we don't think that he – I don't know. I, I kind of – because of his build overall, it just it makes me wonder, is this guy the next to it? cam hayward you know and right now i don't have i don't have enough to say absolutely he can become that guy i've i you know he's kind of on on these he's the defensive version maybe a calvin austin with a lot more snaps played we know some things that he can do but we have got to learn a lot more about demarvin leal moving forward before we start making any any long-term assessments i think yeah, I haven't forgotten about Leal. I try to mention him every time I talk about the room in general. Um, Is he going to be one more of these elephant type, you know, Leo, you know, right. t- Leo type players, you know? Yeah, I know. And I agree with the assessment from the reader that they were going to play him as a full time defensive lineman and they added weight during the summer. And then once Watt got hurt, they had to kind of scrap their plans. He dropped some weight and he ended up kind of playing, you know, kind of a hybrid type role. You compare him to Calvin Austin. I kind of compare him to the the, the defensive version of Connor Hayward, where this guy okay. doesn't have quite the size to fit in any one place. Versatility should be the way to maximize him. He's a tweener, and it's hard for me to think about a guy that is He's a, tweener. a big tweener. He's a big tweener, but still a tweener nonetheless. Is that kind of going to go from tweener to full time defensive lineman in the same vein as Cam Hayward, Chris Wormley, you know, Stephon Tewitt, et cetera? I just don't know if I see that enough in terms of the the anchor in the run game. 
um, being able to be consistent down in the, in the trenches, banging inside. I just worry about that. So could they try that? They, they may try that and go back to that this year. That's certainly a possibility, and we'll have to see and have to learn more about his game. But I think he's still pretty raw overall, and I think he's just kind of that in-between fit that's, that's hard for me to envision him really playing in a consistent role in a 3-4 defense, you know, over uh, playing the B-gap and trying to take on double teams. Look, and this is not us being negative against Calvin Austin and 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 Demar Leal. It, it's just we I, we got to see more. I mean, there's not enough there to make to make assessment you know long term assessments on. I don't feel. Yeah, but the team has to make a decision. What do they want Leal to try to be? Because this whole game, and I know why they did it last year. I'm not mad at them for it. But sure, this whole I'm not thing of, of add weight, drop weight, add weight, drop weight. Like he's got to know who he is. Otherwise, he's going to be Sean Davis, where you try to do, make him become everything and he becomes really nothing for you. He never can really maximize what his skill set is. I mean, just from a picture look at him last year in certain pictures. It looks like they need to decide to go one way or the other with him, you know, and, that, yeah. and that's just from a uh, picture. And then, you know, uh, obviously an all 22 and and, 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 and tape standpoint, he either needs to be able to put that weight on uh, sand in his pants a little bit more, or he needs to go the other way, or he's just going to be this tweener. That's never, that's going to be a more situational situational type guy. Right. Well, if he's a tweener, there's a certain weight he can play for that at 265, 270. And I think you can still, you know, be what he was last year, an edge guy, rotational player and sub package interior rusher on on third down. But, you know, if he's going to be if he's going to become a real defense alignment, he's got to play 300 pounds. And so he can't be a tweener at that point. Maybe Omar Khan will talk a little bit about him at the uh, combine. Yeah, hopefully somebody when maybe one of our guys can can ask. I don't know what kind of answer he would give. I'd be curious to know, but I, I doubt they're going to, well, I don't know. We'll see. I'm not hearing a lot from Khan yet. We'll have to see. Uh, all right. I think we got through uh, the, uh, the questions here, Alex, anything you'd like to add? Uh, you got something coming up tonight, right? Uh, tonight. What, do I, have, what do I have tonight? Uh, Sunday. That's Sunday. Oh, oh, Sunday. I'm sorry. Sunday. Yep. Sunday, 8 PM Eastern time. You can just uh, search my name on YouTube, Alex Kazora, and come hang out with us as we uh, do a three round mock draft in conjunction with walk the mock Been with those guys for a couple of years doing those mocks. And they're a lot of fun. So there'll be 31 other real life GMs, all of us working together in real time. So that's always uh, a lot of fun, a bit earlier this year, but that's okay. And hopefully you guys can join us again. That's Sunday, 8 PM Eastern time. All right, on the YouTube machine, go join Alex, please, and support him uh, with that. Uh, he usually has a pretty good crowd for that. It's pretty exciting to watch uh, them roll through a couple of rounds doing that there. All right, uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, SteedersDepot.com. Hit the uh, uh, donate button up right navigational bar. Also, be an ad free version of the site, uh, Steeders Depot. Com, hit the ad free button up right, right navigation bar. How many uh, draft profiles are we up to now? I'd have to count. We're motoring along pretty good. We're probably in the 60 to 70 range, if All I right. had to guess right now. All right. And Combine hasn't even taken place yet. So that's good news there. Uh, all right, uh, folks. Uh, happy Friday. Happy weekend. And as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.